and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to January 1985 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games, I finally get my hands on a Div IDE, we review some older games, we take a look at a newer title, and take a trip to Type In Corner. But first, it's back to the time machine in January 1985. Elite have issued a recall for its new game, Fall Guy. The game, based on a popular TV series, had loading problems with the first batch, and Elite have had to recall them to fix the issue for the subsequent batches. A brand new television show has been announced by Channel 4. The program, called Four Computer Buffs, boasts several firsts for television. These include real-time bench testing of computers, pitching Amstrad CPCs, BBCs and QLs against each other, with viewers being able to see the results. For those old enough to remember, the test card was a familiar sight on British television, especially at night or early in the morning. If you don't remember these, they were static pictures, displayed when the channel had nothing to broadcast. The iconic one, of course, being the famous BBC one. Nowadays, we rarely see them, as most channels broadcast 24 hours a day. However, back in 1985, Channel 4 decided to use its test card for something different, to broadcast the loading signals for games. This allowed users to record the sound and load them into their computers later. The first broadcast would be on the 12th of February at 10am, when it will be a game for the BBC computer. Other programmes for other micros will follow shortly. A new printer for the Spectrum claims to be the first with built-in intelligence, the Floyd 40. The small device has different print modes, including inverse, double height, double width, and 32 or 40 column printing. The unit will cost $79.95. Curra, the company producing hardware for the Spectrum, have been bought by DKtronics for what is said to be a substantial sum. DKtronics now own the exclusive marketing rights to the entire Curra range, and are also manufacturing the units in their own factory. Curra were having financial problems last year, and eventually called in the receivers. It seems Sinclair are always having supply problems with their latest products. The Microdrive and the QL all have problems, and now, so it seems, so does the Pocket TV. The small black and white device was supplied to large retailers including John Lewis and W. H. Smith in the run-up to Christmas, but not in the numbers required to satisfy the buying public. John Lewis claimed they only got 12 units per branch, which sold out within days, and the next batch was not due until the end of January. Sinclair, of course, played down this story, claiming that all retailers knew the pre-Christmas models were in limited quantities. Sinclair have announced it will be offering an upgrade kit for existing rubber-keyed Spectrum users. The kit will allow users to convert their machines into the new style plus casing. The upgrade can be done either by users or by sending your machine off to Sinclair. The do-it-yourself option will cost £30, whereas the Sinclair route will cost you £50. At the same time Sinclair announced this upgrade, they reduced the price of the Plus machine to £129.95. This move is part of Sinclair's ongoing plans to dominate the UK computer market, and with it comes the sad news that they are to discontinue the rubber-keyed version of the Spectrum, at least in the UK. Once existing stocks are gone, that will be the end of an era in computing history. Released in 1982, the Spectrum grabbed the public's attention and immediately was a hit, with demand far outstripping supply. Goodbye, old friend. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. Top spots this month were held by the big titles like Nightlaw, Booty, Jet Set Willy, and Daily Thompson's Decathlon. But new titles emerging include Spider Man from Adventure International, a rare appearance of an adventure game in the charts, Kung Fu from Bug Bite. A wireframed beat em up. Match Day from Ocean, the great football game written by John Rittman. Pole Position from Atari, the official version of the arcade game. Hunchback 2 from Ocean, the follow up to the arcade clone. and Kong Strikes Back, again by Ocean, and again another follow-up. And that was the news and top-selling games for January 1985. You 
may have seen in a previous episode, the feature about converting tapes to disc for the Plus 3. However, what happens if you haven't got a Plus 3, or a fast storage device, or if you want to load games instantly? Well, this is the device you're after. This is a Divide Yi. Some refer to it as a Divide, but being old school and remembering the old IDE interfaces for 386 and 486 PCs, I can't help but call it a Divide Yi. Whatever you call it, this is a great piece of hardware and will surely be the top of the list for any discerning Spectrum user, and I just wish it had been available in the 80s. There are several different types available, some with cases, some without, some with a nice slim design, others project out of the back. Not wanting to have anything sticking out too far, I opted for the DVIDE 2K version, available from the website on screen. Not wanting to be biased of course, you can also get the others from this website. And you can even get them from eBay. All versions will work with most models of the Spectrum, and you just have to set jumpers or switches on the board first. Whichever version you opt for, the functionality is more or less the same, providing you don't reflash the device, but more about that later. As it stands, the device, as its name suggests, is an interface between your Spectrum and most IDE devices, such as hard drives, CD-ROMs or memory cards, sometimes requiring an additional board if to allow memory cards to work. The slimline version, though, only has connectivity for a compact flash card and requires no further boards. Once you've checked the jumper settings to make sure it's set for your model of Spectrum, turn the Spectrum off, plug the device in, and turn the Spectrum back on again. If everything works fine, with the default firmware, you'll immediately see the DVI-DE screen. Pressing any key will drop you back into the operating system. If you have a 48K machine, this will be 48K Basic. If you have a plus 2 or plus 3, this will be USR Zero mode. This means no menu screen and no access to the floppy drive for plus 3 machines. To activate the interface, just press the button and the Spectrum will display the file browser. Here you can view contents of the flashcard and select the files you want to load. The device supports TAP files and Z80 or SNA files, both 48K and 128K versions. The card can be divided up into folders, for example you could have folders for games, and demos, and 128k games, or tools, and you can also have these subdivided into further folders, for example alphabetical. Of course, being a compact flash card, you can pull it out of the DVI-DE, when the power's off of course, and plug it straight into your PC if you have a card reader. This shows up as a normal memory card, and you can easily copy files across by simply dragging and dropping or copying and pasting. Once finished, Pop the card back into the DVI-DE and power on, and you're ready to go. In the file browser, you can use the cursor keys to move around. Once you've located a file, you press enter. If it's an SNA or Z80 file, it will be loaded automatically. If you select a tap file, you are dropped back to the Spectrum OS, where you have to load it like a normal tape. Pressing the button again can usually load another game. I say usually because some games stop the device from working, in which case you just need to reset. As it stands, the firmware supplied is fatware, which is read-only, meaning you can only load games and not write anything to the card or save game data. A bit limiting if you want to do anything other than play games. Loading a different firmware, typically XDOS or ResiDOS, will reconfigure the whole device and allow writing directly from the Spectrum. ResiDOS and XDOS have some great features too, like tape emulation for reading and writing to the same or a different tape file. And to keep you confused, there are also different versions of different firmware, so be careful. If you do brick your device, you can reflash it using a real tape, so don't worry. When I first got my Plus 3, I was delighted with the floppy drive, but there are many things that simply can't be moved onto disk. I also bought a second 3.5 inch drive, and this still wouldn't work. In particular, I couldn't get Gauntlet 3 onto disk, the multi-load system and large file sizes, means it just wouldn't load correctly, at least for me. The DIVIDE is the solution for the vast majority of things. Anything in the formats mentioned above can be copied from your PC and loaded straight into the Spectrum, including the tape version of Gauntlet 3. I said vast majority. Some things just didn't work anyway, regardless of what I did, probably to do with timings of the load, or a program wanting to write to the media. The one that really annoyed me though was my favourite game Jetpack. This is a bit of a mystery, because the original tape will not work on a native plus 3. You have to switch to 48k mode. Even USR Zero mode doesn't work. 
There must be a fixed version somewhere, because the game was included on disc in Ultimate's Collected Works. So here's a request from me. If anyone has collected works on disc, or possibly even tape for the Plus 2 machine, I would be interested to know if there are any changes to the loader, or if the game is different, because I just can't get it to work. And it is, after all, my favourite game. But for the vast majority of games and applications that don't need to save data, the Divide E works brilliantly. Writing to the device at the moment isn't a priority for me, so I'll be sticking with fatware, at least for the time being. It is, however, nice to know that should I need the option later, I can reflash it with another firmware. The only other downside I can think of is that on a Plus 3 machine you can't access the disk drive. So even if you do load a word processor from the memory card, you can't save the files out anywhere. But apart from that, overall it's a superb piece of kit, and anyone who uses a real Spectrum frequently will wonder how they ever managed without it. All of your games, demos and programs on one card, even a small card like 512 meg like I've got, will fit practically everything you need, all selectable and loaded in seconds. So, if you can afford it, it's well worth the price. Like Fixen, when it was released in 1988 by Martek, caused quite a controversy due to the advertisement and cover design of the game. Like other games that came under fire, such as Game Over 2 and Barbarian 2, the reason was the depiction of a scantily clad female. In the case of Vixen, it was Page 3 model Corinne Russell. High Street Chain Boot refused to stock it, forcing Martek to re-release with a less provocative cover. There were several re-releases, and the one I have is from React. So, down to the game. You play the Vixen, the last human of the planet Grana. Raised by foxes, she now has to get revenge on the dinosaurs that now rule the planet. To do this, she moves from left to right across a scrolling landscape, collecting items and killing the creatures that are out to stop her. Using her whip, she can destroy hanging globes and tombstones that reveal the things that can help. You can also use the whip to kill the dinosaurs. The main character is very well drawn and beautifully animated. She can crawl, walk and jump, and has the ability to transform into a fox. This can only be achieved by collecting enough fox heads that appear when globes are destroyed. At this point the gameplay changes to an underground setting, and the fox has to make it to the other side, collecting as many items as possible without dying. Missing one jump results in the whole section being abandoned, which is a bit harsh really. The fox animation is not as good, and the sprite is much smaller, and altogether less impressive. The gameplay, when in human mode, is very much the same for each level. Walk or crawl along, kill the dinosaurs, collect things, and get to the end without dying, in the allotted time. The character is easy to control and progress is made quickly, although some of the jumps are a bit tight and you have to be very precise. There's a great tune that plays at the beginning of the game, but sound within the game is limited to spot effects like the whip sound. This is a challenging game that will take quite a time to master, and can soon become repetitive. There is no doubt that the selling point of this game, apart from Corinne Russell, is the great animation. But does this make up for an overall average game? Well, I'll leave that to you. It's your choice. But I would certainly say give it a go before deciding. Volcanic Planet from Thorn EMI is an interesting game and comes in a really nice inlay depicting a fight between someone who looks like a punk and a strange alien creature. It's your task to destroy all the aliens, called Xerons, by travelling to their planet Xerus, locating the volcanic plug and planting a bomb there. The bomb is set to explode in a certain amount of time, flooding the planet and the alien base with lava. You, of course, have to escape before this happens. The game has five difficulty settings, which relate to the number of levels in the base. The easiest mode gives you just three levels. Starting at the top level, you have to search for the lift to take you down. Once at the lowest level, Based on the skill you selected, you have to find the plug, plant your bomb, set the timer, and run like hell. 
The Zirun's base, of course, is occupied, but they don't all attack you. It's easy to move around without killing anything, and this is the best approach. Occasionally one of the Zirun's will take a shot at you. Deal with these on their own and continue your task. If you do go in guns blazing, the more Zirun's will attack you. If you haven't already guessed by the plot and the actual gameplay, this is very close to the Amiga classic Alien Breed. The screen displays the map of the current level, along with the usual health and scoring. The screen moves in character-based jumps, but that's okay for this game, and only occasionally do you get stuck in narrow corridors. During your travels you can pick up items that refresh your health, and it's always a good idea to keep an eye out for these, because when the Zirans shoot you, you lose your health. There's a lot squeezed into this 16k game, and I really enjoyed playing it. And there's a great thrill once the bomb is set and you're charging back to the top level, trying to remember where the lifts were, and hoping that the Zirans don't decide to attack you. There is only one problem with this game, but it's a big one, and that's the sound. There isn't any. None at all. No firing sound, no walking sound, no explosions, nothing. The best way I've had to play this game is to have some suitable music playing in the background. Maybe even Alistair Brimble's fantastic Alien Breed music, which is playing over the top of this review. I would certainly suggest giving this game a try. This is International Ninja Rabbits, released by Microvalue in 1991. A factory has been spewing out evil chemicals that are affecting the animals, and you, as a ninja rabbit, take on the job of sorting it out. You have to get to the factory and stop the leaks, but the chemical has affected the other animals and they want to attack you. Yes, it's a beat-em-up, of the animal kind. As you can see, the graphics are very large and well drawn, but the backgrounds are just too detailed, and that, coupled with the colours used, make it very difficult to see what's going on at times. Some of the characters blend into the background, and because you have to time your kicks and punches based on the distance from them, it can be tricky. The screen doesn't scroll, instead you fight two opponents, usually taking about four hits to disperse them, before moving on to the next screen. In some areas you can drop down into the sewers or a cave, and if you're lucky you can find a carrot, which will help keep your strength up. There are only a limited amount of moves to use, which keeps things simple. You've got low, mid and high kicks and a punch, and that's about it. The game pace is dreadfully slow, as you can probably tell, with the main character sometimes not responding to your key presses for about a second, and plodding across the screen at a speed not befitting a rabbit. Animation is good, although the rabbit does look like he's walking with a limp. Either that or doing the impression of Charlie Chaplin. Sound-wise, there's a great tune that plays on the intro screen, and is playing underneath this review. But in-game sounds are limited to just a puck-puck sound, as you or your opponent lands a blow. The game has three difficulty settings, and I'm playing here on easy. And it was fun for a few plays, but the pace just kills it. There are three levels in total, plus the smaller underground sections. But don't expect any great finale when you reach the end, you just get a simple well-done message. There are better beat-em-ups for the Spectrum, and don't judge this game on watching me play it. I initially watched the RZX replay of the game and thought it was terrible, but having played it, it is better than it looks, but only just.
thought it was time I plugged one of my own games again, so here is Chopper Drop, released in 2011. Playing a helicopter pilot, it's your job to collect packages and deliver them to the waiting lorry. Collect all four within the time limit and you move to the next level. This isn't as easy as it sounds, and there are things in the way that you have to avoid, otherwise your time limit will be decreased. Cranes, buildings, trees, birds and balloons are just some of the things that you'll need to avoid, all the time keeping an eye on the ever-decreasing time. Packages are collected by simply flying into them, and are automatically dropped onto the lorry when you are directly above it. If your version doesn't automatically drop them, you need to get a newer version, because this feature was added by request from the World of Spectrum forums, and does improve the gameplay. Graphics and sound are nice, as you can see, and the difficulty is easy to average. Once you get used to controlling the chopper, it's easy to whiz about collecting packages. Some levels require a bit of strategy too, as some packages will take longer to get due to other moving hazards like blimps and balloons. In these screens you have to decide which is the best order to minimise the time you have. From the feedback in the forums, it was well received, although a few people said it reminded them of several other games. I can definitely say it was not intentionally copied from any other Spectrum game. It was, in fact, originally going to be a copy of the Flash game from the UK television show The Gadget Show, called Heligolf. This, however, proved too complex, and so Chopper Drop morphed into its current state. A nice little game, then. It's free, so why not give it a try? Welcome to Typing Corner. This month's game is Moon Buggy by Adrian Robson, that appeared in the October 1985 issue of Computer and Video Games. No prizes for guessing which arcade game this is based on, and being mostly in basic, there are a few things missing. The listing covers three pages. Quite daunting, really, when you had no idea whether it would work or not once you'd finished typing it all in. The game has a few features not often found in other typings, one being the option to redefine the control keys, the other being a high score table. Not expecting too much from this basic game, I was surprised when I loaded it from one of the old tapes. You control a nicely drawn buggy as it moves across the moon. You have to jump the craters and make it to the next level. There is no shooting like the arcade game, and you can't drop into the craters. If you do, your buggy will get destroyed, so you have to stick to the top level. The jump is controlled based on your speed, and can take quite a while to get used to, but once you've mastered it, the game becomes much more playable. When you reach the end of the level, you get a nice animation as your buggy is lowered to the next one. There are only two levels in this game, which is a shame, as I really enjoyed playing it. At the time this episode was released, this game was not in the world of Spectrum Archives, and it's probably the first time it's been seen since 1985. It will be available for download from my blog soon, and available in the world of Spectrum Archives at the next update. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.